I want to um, take a moment before I get into the Bible, and I want to share with you, um, I think, a tremendous story, and one of the, I don't know if it's a joy of being Moses or a curse, <laughs> but I forget stuff real bad. So if I've already told you about this, would you just do me a favor and just humor me and go, oh man, that's great, right? <laughs> I didn't do anything, it's not about me, but I, um, many of you, you, I know we talked about it on Wednesday, but many of you that are here right now that are not here on Wednesday night, uh, but some of you know Dave and Judy Strickland, okay? Um, precious, precious couple, and uh, they were here at our church for some time, felt called of the Lord to go to South Carolina to start a pastor's retreat, okay? And I just want to say that people aren't called out of the church, they're called to something, okay? And they were called to do something of him. They weren't unhappy and packing their toys and leaving. They were called of the Lord to do something. And with our blessing, have gone to go start this pastor's retreat, South Carolina. Well, um, they're, no, they're not spring chickens. And, and Dave's parents are still alive. His dad is 92. His wife, his dad's uh, wife, his mom. Uh, I didn't ask her how old she is. I'm learning. I'm learning. And, uh, but she's right up there, <laughs> okay? And, and Dave's dad fell last week and broke his leg at the ball in the, in the hip and broke his wrist, bumped his head, and when he went in to get this taken care of, he had a heart attack. Oh my. And so he's not in very good shape, and then since then he's had another heart attack. Um, Dave and Judy have been praying for Dave's dad. He is a tough old bird, a proud man and a good man, a great dad from what I understand. He's been married to, that, to his wife, Dave's mom for 70 years. 70. Okay, yeah, that deserves a clap. Okay? And, and so I went to the hospital the other day because Judy wrote me on Facebook Messenger and said that, you know, his dad's not doing well and he refuses to say yes to Jesus. He won't pray. He doesn't want to talk about it. Never wanted to. And um, for those of you who have been praying for something for a long time, be encouraged. Dave and Judy have been praying for this man for a zillion years. And when I got to the hospital the other day, um, I shook his hand, and he almost broke my hand. This guy's so strong. Like, it was awesome, right? And then when he said that they were married for 70 years, I went to go shake his hand again. And when I did, I was ready for him, you know? So when I did it, he went like, ah! And I was like, ah! You know, I thought I, like, hurt the old guy. Like, like this guy's, like, not making it. And I'm like, ah, right? And he goes, oh, just kidding. I'm like, oh, and Dave's like, oh, he's just that way, you know. Just a great guy, you know. So, uh, so anyway, we get done joking around, and Dave says, hey, Dad, do you, do you think that maybe we could just have a prayer? And he's like, sure. And, uh, he go, and I said, well, and then I chimed in. I said, well, thank you, sir. I said, but, um, you know, I, I'm a Christian, and, my, and, and your son, Dave, my, I love him, you know, he's my friend, and He's a Christian too, and of course, um, you know what we're gonna we're gonna pray to Jesus, and I, I don't want to offend you. I mean, this is your time, and I would that be okay? And he says, he contemplated, he thought, he says, yeah, that'd be fine. And so, of course, I didn't stop, and I said, well, the reason why we're praying to Jesus is because that when when we pray, we want to believe that there's someone who's actually listening. And someone who has the, actually, uh, the ability to do what we're asking. And so we ask Jesus we, because we believe that Jesus is able, that he's the Lord. Do you believe that? And he looked at me and he thought, he goes, yeah, I do. I looked over at Dave and he's like. <laughs> if something's heavy in your heart, I got stuff in my life right now. And I'm prone to give up praying. Don't. 92 years old. 92 years old. <clears throat> Since then, he's taken a, a, a dive. Very coherent. I went to go visit him today. Very coherent. 
He's not doing well. But he and his wife spoke. His kids spoke with him. And he consciously, very, very, and he's very aware still. Like you wouldn't know that this is happening, but he says, no. The doctor said we can either go to rehab, which is probably going to kill you. We can go the cath route, which is probably going to kill you. Or we could send you to hospice and make you very comfortable. And you can hold your wife's hands until you pass. <clears throat> awesome. What's on his, you know when you go to the hospital room and on the board, they have a board, a dry erase board? Doctor's name, pain level, all that. What medications? What's most important to you? And they ask the, 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 they ask the, 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 the patient that. His quote is that my bride is by my side. 70 years. Mm, makes me want to stop right here and just leave you all and go run back there and hug Meredith. <laughs> Very wise man right there. Awesome, right? Oh, please buy me by my side. <laughs> <clears throat> so he decided to go to hospice, and, and today I went there and I asked Dave if it was okay, and I asked Don, this man, I said, is it okay if I read you some scripture about this step you're about to take into eternity? And I got to share... Revelation, I think it's chapter 21, where it talks about that God will wipe away all your tears, take away your pain and sorrow, and there's no more fear, and there's no more death. You know, and, and I got to share that with him, just to talk about this new reality that he's got in his life, and kind of got to share that with his, with his sons, his other two sons that are not, Dave doesn't even know if they're believers, you know, they don't talk about it, and his wife. So it's just a joyous time. And so I just want to encourage you, like, no matter how long you've been praying, no matter how it seems like impossible, God's the God of impossible. Talk to the dudes in the prison cell, man. Amen. Right? And he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And, and, and two days ago, the prison cell that Don was in, God ripped those doors open, and he's free. Okay? That's the God we serve. So don't, if you're going to clap, man, you're going to clap for God, you clap for God. You know, just half heart that thing, okay? That's it. All right. All right, well, do me a favor. Um, grab a copy of God's Word. Super important. And turn to 1 John chapter 2. And um, I can't promise you that I'm going to be reading out of the NLT tonight. I'm going to do a little bit of jumping around from NLT to Holman Christian Standard just because... Um, NLT is really great when you need to have some clarity because it might be a little bit confusing. But in some of the verses that we're going to be sharing tonight, there's no reason for anyone to enhance or explain anything. They're very explicit. And so I'll be reading um, from Holman Christian Standard. But we're going to continue in our message series called Need to Know. And, uh, you know, Jesus said that the, that the gate is very narrow <laughs> and the road is very difficult. And very few ever find it. And, uh, you know, and so I think, and I'm not sure 100%, I'm just trying to come to you and do the best that I can do and tell you that when, when, when Jesus says that the road is difficult, uh, I think he understands what he's talking about. And I understand just from my 15 years, uh, the road to our final destination, even if you found the gate, even if you found the gate, the road to the final destination is pretty difficult. And, and many of us are, are many steps along on the road and found as we look back that it's been pretty tough to follow Christ um, consistently over the years, right? It's been very, very difficult. And so uh, I believe that John is writing this book to give us some of these pitfalls that we can fall into. It's written to believers. He's not trying to get them saved. He's trying to talk to them about, listen, saved ones, here's some problems, man. you got to watch out for this stuff, right? Because your relationship with the Lord is really in jeopardy. you got to watch out for some of this stuff. And so I think that's just me. That's why I wrote this book. And so let me just say, in, in, in starting out as an intro, if you will, I've been, I've been a Christian for 15 years. And a lot of you have been a Christian a lot longer than me. I, I grew up a Jewish boy from the, a little white Jewish boy from the suburbs of Massachusetts. In Sharon, Massachusetts, 
a little privileged town where everything is all peachy keen and perfect and great school systems and no crime and everyone had a decent house and no one ever really wanted for anything. And we went to temple and, and I was a good little Jewish boy and got bar mitzvahed. You saw through that little lie there, didn't you? And uh, is it that obvious? So, so, but I got bar mitzvahed and I, and, and I like that because I made 2,500 bucks during that thing and it was good. And I had no idea what I was talking about, but I read this, this t- half Torah, you know, this little portion of the Torah. Anyway, so um, I knew nothing really about God. And, and, and I would just say, because I'm not an expert in, in, in Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness and Catholicism, and I'm not even an expert in this, and I'm telling you, uh, so I'm not, I'm not trying to say what it's like, but I, from what I hear from people who grew up in Catholic church, Sometimes it's like that. You go, mom and dad said, you go. And you shut up or else I'll give you the business, right? And, and, and sometimes they're speaking in Latin, right? They're in, I'm in the temple. They're speaking Hebrew. I don't know anything that's going on. I just knew that when the service was over, you got to go downstairs and have some herring and gefilte fish. That was pretty good. Someone say gross, right? <laughs> totally gross. And, and so they fed us that and can deprived us of cheeseburgers. Sin. Sin, sin, okay. So, so anyway, so I'm, I'm Jewish kid, right? I don't really know anything. I, like, I've, I know the story of Noah, you know, the ark, the arky, arky. And, and, and I knew about Abraham, you know. Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And I knew about Moses, because I'd watched the Ten Commandments, and I knew that it was Charlton Heston. I knew all that stuff, right? But I, know, I knew nothing of God. I knew the stories. I knew nothing of God, and when some, somehow, some way, God saw through all the junk of my life and all of the stuff that I had gone through and all of my unbelief and unaware and stupidity and all that stuff and my experiences and the American dream that captured my heart, and he saw through all that stuff, and he brought people into my life that, that loved Jesus. They knew about God, and they started to share him with me, and so I got a copy of God's Word, and I started reading it, and and when I opened it and I read it, it was like, <sighs> like all the, 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 the questions that, le- these are not questions that I could articulate, but the questions of my soul that I couldn't understand before, like the reason I'm living and why I felt this way and what to do and my purpose and all the big things that my soul craved that I was trying to, 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 to stick a square peg in a round hole and I couldn't get answers, and I started reading the Bible, and it was like, wow! And, and I started reading it tenaciously. This is my original Bible. See, this is what, it, I'm not bragging, I'm nothing, but this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like when you get after it, okay? This is what it looks like, and it fell apart. And then when this one fell apart, I started reading this one. And you can see the condition of it, right? You can almost see through the cover. I've held on to it so much. The pages, the oil from my hand, tears, highlights. You can see through some of the pages. Like, I'm getting after this thing big time. And it's not to brag about who I am because, again, I'm just nothing. I am a guy that was weak with no answers. And I found a source for the answers of my soul. And I was digging into it. And I've learned so much over the 15 years about God and about myself and, and, and really about you guys, too. And about purpose and worship and prayer and marriage and finances, all kinds of stuff, all new awesome stuff that's just floating around in my head and in my heart. And the neat thing, the Bible says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this word, but let God transform you into a new, per- into a new person by changing the way you think. And that's what's happening. All this stuff that I was studying, it's reshaping who I am. and It's shaping what I do with my life. And because of the blessing, and I know that it is, that God has given me to be your pastor, this stuff that he's teaching me that I'm learning, it's helping to shape your life as well. And for that, I am happy. I am humbled. And I am completely, honestly, horrified horrified because the Bible says that I'm going to have to give an account okay you don't have to give an account for what you tell me but I do have to give an account for what I tell you and I know that and so it's horrifying to me but I 
feel like Paul, woe to me if I don't. I'm compelled. Like, I have no choice. And as many times as I've wanted to run and hide and say I'm not worthy, and this time, I'm going to tell you something. And for those of you who have preached, you know that when you're standing up here, oftentimes it's like you, you know they have the, 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 the devil and the angel thing, you know? It's just kind of a little funny caricature on Tom and Jerry. But you understand that there's times when you're preaching and the devil himself is standing right there going, you're a piece of crap. Get down off that freaking stage. You've been married. You've been divorced. What did you do this afternoon? You have no right to talk about that. You felt that, haven't you? I have. But I'm compelled. And so you have to just work through it and you have to shut that voice up while my voice is being projected over you. I'm having to shut that voice up. It's not easy. It's hard. Nobody wants this weight. But for those who have been called, you do it. Because you do as you're told. You do as you're told. Now, I mentioned this about the Bibles. Because even though I have several worn out Bibles, and if you go in my little closet of an office over there on the wall, there's this piece of paper that says I have a seminary degree from, you know, for Bible and even though I've got worn out Bibles and some seminary degree, i got to tell you that there's some things that, listen, I just don't know. I just flat out don't know them, man. I, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to say I don't know. And I think the church needs a little bit more of that. I don't know. You know, if you have a God that you could somehow figure out, why would you even want to go to his church? What's the size of a brain? I'm not a scientist about that big. You guys think I'm about accurate? Somewhere about that? Don't be difficult. Come on now. It's about the size of a brain, right? Average. Someone say something other than I don't know, right? Okay, listen, 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 listen. listen. Here's a brain, right? Here's a brain. Here's a brain. And I believe it's in the book of Job's, Job that says that the known universe is but the fringes of his robe. Look, loved ones, look. See that? The entire universe compared to God is like that. And we have one little grapefruit inside of our head. I don't know some stuff. Can somebody please, what, I'm, what do I mean by this? Can somebody with clarity and complete, in no uncertain terms, accurately describe to me the Trinity and how that works? And I mean, like, there's, the, there's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Spirit. I don't get all that. I, according to this book, I've experienced the ministry of all three. So, and I know that it says that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. But yet, the Bible says that there's only one God and don't worship any others. There's, I am the Lord God. The, the, I'm one. Boom! Right? Like I, like, so somehow we have to try to take this reality of three and shove it into a one. And we've been taught that one doesn't equal three, and three doesn't equal one, but somehow by faith we have to believe that, and I do. And I don't know why or how. I just do by faith. Can somebody tell me, can you explain to me that before anything was, there was God? Doesn't that just defeat the whole first part of that statement? But yet, but right just say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. How about, so, so there's a story about Jesus. Every story about Jesus is so great. So he's, he's hanging out doing his Jesus thing one day, just being God and all. And these religious folks bring this lady up because, you know, she's been cheating on her husband. So, so they bring her up and they just, just cast her down there in front of him. And, you know, they say, hey, 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 rabbi. <laughs> Look what she's been doing. Like they're some angel, right? And, 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 and she's been, she, we caught her. She was cheating. And, and the law says we're supposed to stone her to death. So you guys may have all heard that. But the part I want to point out to you is that at some point in that story, somehow Jesus gets down 
And he writes something in the sand, right? What, what, what did he write? People have been arguing about that forever. Let me ask you a question. If he wanted you to know what it said, right? There's this other story about Paul, the great apostle Paul. The guy who, who, like he was a healing machine, this guy, right? And yet, he, it says in the scriptures that he had this thorn in his side. What was that? And, 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 and he, he had this thorn in his side, and he asked, like, if, Paul, if the apostle Paul came to you, and, and, and you said, would you please, I have the faith to believe it. Would you pray for me? And, and I believe that God's going to heal. And, and Paul would pray, and man, people would just get healed. It was like nothing to him. But yet when he asked God to heal him of this thing, he says, three times I asked. And three times he said, no. That's not the point, though. The point is, what's this thorn? I don't know. And then the one that drives me the craziest. And it's going to tick some people off. And that's okay. Go back and read your Bible and figure it out for yourself. I'm not responsible for your decision. <laughs> Jesus said, you're going to do greater things than me. You guys know that he said that? Yeah. Awesome. But yeah, it's amazing. I've never seen anyone open up their mouth and have a planet come out of it. <laughs> See, if we, if we can do all those things... If you could do exactly what God does, I fear that that's not just one God anymore. And somehow his credentials are lessened when everybody can do what he does. Listen, he spoke and the universe came out of his mouth. You do that, those who say, he said we could do greater things than him. I challenge you to do it. And I'm not saying that I have the right theology. I'm just saying we need to have a high view of who God is. He is unique. There is no one like him. And it's the epitome of human arrogance that says, oh, we could be like God. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? We need to be careful of these things. And we need to just say, I don't know sometimes. You know, I've learned so much in my tenacious pursuit of spirit and truth worship. But even though I've learned tons, there's still stuff that falls into this drawer. I don't know, I got this drawer, I got this file. It's, it's called Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. It just says this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. It's just like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I really don't know why it's like this. I don't have an idea what Paul's thorn was. I don't know what Jesus wrote. There's just some things I don't know. And I'll never stand up here and say that I know all of that. And I think that the church needs a little healthy dose of that. You know, Rome, uh, Romans 11 describes, uh, this is Paul speaking. And Paul, the great apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, who somehow got sucked up to the third heaven. Again, what do we say to that? I don't know. I don't know, man. Third heaven? I mean, I, I, let's just, can we just call it this? Awesome. Wherever it was, whatever he saw, awesome, right? But this guy, Paul, in Romans 11, he says, who can understand or know the Lord's thoughts? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said, who can understand or know the Lord's thoughts? And, and let me ask you this. Why would this brilliant apostle, I mean a real apostle, a real apostle of God, a brilliant man of God who wrote much of the New Testament say such a thing if somehow you and I can know all things about this transcendent, eternal being 
Well, shouldn't Paul be able to then? But yet he says, who could know? Who could know? Well, the truth is this. And I stand firm in this. This is the truth. It's found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah says, this amazing man of God, inspired by the Spirit of God to write these things in his book, with his name as the title, in the 55th chapter. It just says that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And listen, it goes further. And our ways... The things that we think, the things that we do, are not his ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth. Remember what I just said about your brain? This little thing compared to the fringes? How how far, how far does the heavens go? Like if, like, you know, we, we have some flat earthers. Don't raise your hand. But no matter whether you're a flat earther or a round earther, you understand that, like, if you go up, you could just kind of keep going. How far can you go? Anyone have an idea how big the universe is? No, you don't. I don't either. But would you say it's pretty far? Very far. And God's word says, as far as that is, like, forever? Right there? That's, That's the difference between your thoughts and your ways and mine, declares the Lord. That's what he said. Your ways are not. (laughs) And the reason, and for this reason, pardon me, for this reason, brilliant biblical scholars from different camps are fighting all the time and have been for generations. You know, you can get a text in the scripture and you can go to the Southern Baptist Convention and you can hand the president, probably a brilliant man, who is it now, Jack Graham maybe, and you can hand him that text and say, I want you to, I want you to ring out that text and tell us exactly what it means. And then you can take that same Bible, the same text, and go over to the Episcopal bishop or whoever, I don't even know who's in charge of that thing, and, and say, I want you to... I want you to explain that text to me, and I want you to ring it out to its, to its last point, and they'll bring it, and a lot of times, they're different. I don't know, man, but they'll both say that, they're, that those spirits convicted, you know, with my spirit, and with, yeah, they, you both said that. Who's right? I don't know, <laughs> Right? Right? Deuteronomy? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. And, and, and so, <laughs> you just got to... Can we just all... This is, this is going to be so much fun. Can we just all just do this? Just come and humble ourselves before the Master. And literally, put your head down as a symbol of your humility. And just say, God, I don't know. I don't know some stuff. I don't, listen, I don't know some stuff. And that's where I'm at with this text that I want to share with you tonight. I don't know. I don't know. L- let me read it with you. 1 John chapter 2, just a couple verses. Verse 18. Look, this is, this is a mind blow for your pastor. Okay, and I'll talk about that. So um, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 says, Children, it is the last hour. You know, for those who say that Jesus is coming like tomorrow, oh, I'm telling you, it's the last days, the last days. Yeah, they said this back then too. Again, how about this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Doesn't that feel good? Isn't that liberating? Take the weight off. I don't know. I don't know. God knows. Not Jesus, though. God the Father knows. Jesus doesn't even know, so don't think you do. Children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard, Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. We know from that 
this. We know from this that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. Super difficult for me. Let me tell you why. I am so not the end all of theology. Okay? I am so not. Uh, no one is. No one is. But I believe that I have a clear understanding of this entire letter of 1 John. I believe that I do. I believe I have a full understanding of it. And, my, and only that, the reason why I say that is not only do I read 1 John and, and really believe that I understand what he's saying, but I believe that my belief, that my position is really congruent with the other 65 books of the Bible. Okay, and so that's why I believe I understand it. But the problem with this text that I just read to you is that these two verses, these itty bitty little verses, and how, how many thousand verses there are in the Bible, these two fly in the face of everything that I believe. And I can't just dismiss the rest of the Bible to say, yeah, but I believe these two. But I also, at the same time, can't just take those two and sweep them under the rug and pretend they don't exist. I have to evaluate it. I have to study it. I have to meditate on it because we're in the book of 1 John where he's talking about your eternity. And so it's super important, right? So I have to study it. But it baffles me. Here's another reason why I don't understand it. When I need to carefully study God's word to rightly divide it, I go to the King James. Now the reason why I go to the King James is because I have a concordance. And the concordance, this guy is strong, he's a brilliant man. He took all the words in that Bible and he made a big book and he gave definitions in Hebrew and Greek for every word. So you could really understand what, you know, because there's not a lot of, there's a lot of words in, you know, like from Greek or Hebrew to English that just don't match up perfectly. And I don't understand everything because I'm not the smartest guy in the world. And so I wanted to read the King James. But did you, I noticed something in the King James. I and mean, if you're not a King James person, you won't know this. If you are a King James person, you may, you may not. There's a lot of words that are in the King James that are italics. Did you notice this? I'm not a big King James guy, so I just noticed it this week. Do you know why they're in italics? Well, if you go to the book, beginning of the book, it'll tell you why. Because there's no direct translation from Greek or Hebrew to English or back and forth. So what does that mean? Brilliant people did the best that they could. Now, I, I appreciate that. But I don't want to drive a stake in the ground on the best that I got. That's not really what we should do. The third reason why I, I struggle with this is words like they went out from us because they're not of us. That can mean a lot of different things. Does it mean geography? Does it mean they were going to a church? They didn't have church like this, by the way. It wasn't quite like this. Was it because they went to, you know, First Baptist Bethlehem? And, you know, like, what, what did that, what is that? So because if you say, you know, they, were, they went out from us, but they were never of us, I, well, what do you mean by that? Well, the problem with that is when you go to the King James and you see that, and you go to the concordance, it says, see, pre preface. And when you go to the preface, there's no definitions for those words. So what does it mean? Here we are again. Let's try it. I don't know. There's also another problem. This is the fourth issue. There's another reason why I can't drive a stake in the ground in, on these verses. is because the Bible has two different types of verses. There's descriptive text. Okay? What I mean by that is describing a specific situation. Okay? Pentecost. Right? Awesome. 
Yeah, we were singing about it. Tongues of fire, testifying of the sun, right? So one day the believers are hanging out, and, and, they're, and, and all of a sudden the building shakes, and a big wind comes whipping through the room, and tongues of fire drop out of the ceiling on top of their heads, and they're speaking different languages. Hello. Right? That don't happen every day, does it? That's a descriptive text. It's describing an amazing occurrence in the life of the church. He's not saying when you go to church every weekend, that's going to happen. It's a descriptive text. But then there's a prescriptive text. These are verses that are for everybody, for every situation, like 1 John 2, 9. Anyone who claims they live in the light. Do you hear that? Every one word. Anyone, who, anyone or everyone who claims they live in the light, but they hate a brother, they're living in darkness. That's for everybody. He's like, Andy, for God so loved the world that whosoever. Prescriptive. Prescriptive, right? So let me ask you a question. These verses, which one is it? Prescriptive? Descriptive? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, verses 13, I think it is, he said this. Anyone who claims to be, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I messed up there. Pardon me. I got ahead of myself. I'm excited. Based on the whole book of 1 John and from all that I can study in Scripture, I don't believe that if they're a real Christian, then that means they'll remain a real Christian. I don't believe that in light of all of Scripture, that that could mean that. That, and this is just me. That's the issue that I have. What's commonly taught is that because they're real Christians, they'll stay a real Christian forever. If they were really of us, they wouldn't leave us. But they were never really part of who we are. They're not really believers. So that means that's why they left. And I have a problem with that. That's a big deal. Um, I don't want to ignore the, the elephant in the room on, this, on these two verses either, this whole idea of antichrist. I just want to address that before we move on. And it's definitely part of what I was just talking about, but I just want to address this. Um, someone in the church today was talking about the antichrist. A term is used loosely by people, you know, Oh, Obama's the Antichrist. Trump's the Antichrist. Hillary's the Antichrist. Oprah's the Antichrist. The Antichrist, the Antichrist, the Antichrist. Now, I may be wrong, but I looked up in the Bible, and I looked up in the concordance, and I've never seen in the Bible this reference to the Antichrist. Now, there's terms in the Bible that talk about, you know, a beast and this different things that are going to do things, but this the Antichrist, it's not in the Bible. This term Antichrist is used only five times in all of the Bible, and it's used only by this man, the Apostle John. Antichristos, okay? And it's just this. It's an opponent to the Messiah. Anyone or anything that would stand in opposition to the work of Jesus Christ is Antichrist. That, that's all this is, okay? It's not, it's not just, you know, it's not the devil, the, the, right? It's, it's anyone that he may use to oppose the work of Christ in his building of his church, okay? That's Antichrist. Antichrist works against Jesus, okay? And so listen, Matthew 12, 30. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Okay, there's only three types of people in this world. There's people who are completely not working for Jesus. They're working for the enemy. 
This people who are working for Jesus, like advancing his kingdom, they're in him, they're working for him, they're serving him. Or there's the neutral who's doing nothing, and Jesus covers two of the three. Nothing is the same as working against me, he said. So for all of us that are compl- like look at look at your life are you are you actively engaged in the ministry and the mission of Jesus Christ to advance his kingdom to the ends of the earth are you do are you are you praying are you are you seeking him are you sharing him are you serving him are you investing in his kingdom are you doing all those things because if you're not doing anything he said you're opposing me that's antichrist So for the for the lethargic believer There's danger there because Jesus said, if you're not working for me, you're actually opposing me. High standards this Jesus has. I see the message of the letter of 1 John as believer beware. Don't Don't get lazy in your love. Don't get distracted by your desires. Don't let obedience be old news. You know, something you used to do. And the glaring caution flag that's here in this text is that people that were part of the church became antichrist. That's scary. I don't understand the they were they went out from us they were never they weren't from us I don't get all that but I had this sense when I was studying this you know when you watch a movie or a TV show and there's that disclaimer that comes up first you know the views and 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 opinions of the actors don't necessarily line up with the the studio right <laughs> and and that's kind of what it's like you know you know, they, 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 may, they may go to revolution, they may have gone to revolution, but, but, but what they say and what they do and what they teach might not necessarily be in line with what the church really believes and stands for. Now listen, loved ones, this letter is written to believers. This letter is not written to unbelievers. It is written to the saved. And so there's two clear warnings that are, that are voiced aggressively, big time, with flags right here from John. Here's the first one. Be careful what church folks say. Be careful. Be careful. Check it. Listen, heaven help you if you just sit here and listen to what I tell you. I am not God. I am not his word. I am nothing but an unworthy servant doing my duty because woe to me if I do not preach. Woe to you if you don't check what I preach because your eternity is in the balance. And so in Acts 17, the apostle Paul, whose words I'm using to teach you, he even said when I'm preaching, he admired and commended the people in Berea. Check me. Check me. Check what I say. Check what I say. Be careful what church people say. Listen, just because they were in our church, they came out of the church, you've got to be careful what they say. Be careful what church folks say. Check it. Okay? Check it. That's the first thing. Be careful what you're taught. Here's the second thing. Be careful that it's not you. Be careful that it's not you. It's starting to get a little bit darker and, and more difficult in here right now. Be careful that it's not you. Are you Christ or are you Antichrist? Talking to church folks, he was. Are you Christ or are you Antichrist? Look at it, look at it. No one's immune to this. I don't care how many years you've studied. I don't care how many times you've been an elder. I don't care how many years you're in the pulpit. It doesn't make any difference. I'm not immune to it. You're not immune to it. No Christian's immune to it, okay? No one, no one. And I'm going to show you clearly from the Word of God that what I'm telling you is true. Okay? Lest you fall. Be warned by the Word of God. Romans chapter 1. Go there with me, please. Extended section of Scripture I'm going to read to you. I know you guys don't mind. You love the Bible, right? Awesome. Awesome. 
Okay, Romans chapter 1, look at verse 18. I'm going to read you a, a, an extended section. Romans 1, 18 through 32, okay? You ready? I'm reading out of a home and Christian standard, so maybe a little bit different than yours. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since they... Since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. From the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, that is, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what He has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God... They did not glorify Him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the cravings of their hearts to sexual impurity So their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served something created instead of the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This is why God delivered them over to degrading passions. For even their females exchanged natural sexual intercourse for what is unnatural. The males in the same way also left natural sexual intercourse with females and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Males committed shameless acts with males and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty for their perversion. And because they did not think it worthwhile to have God in their knowledge, God delivered them over to a worthless mind. To do what is morally wrong. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, disputes, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Although they know full well God's just sentence that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do these things, but even applaud others who practice them. Some translations would say they encourage other people to do the same not satisfied with their own sin, but encouraging others to act in that despicable, despicable way. So the Holman Christian Standard said something. It said he gave them up to a worthless mind. These people were evil, arrogant, proud, murderers, unloving, sentenced to death by God, and they were God-haters. These are people with a worthless mind. That's what it says. And the translation in the King James, the Greek word is, I'll probably misstate it, but a dokimos. A dokimos or a whatever. A dokimos. The King James translates it, he gave them up to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. These are people that are God-haters. They're evil. They're arrogant. They're proud. They're murderers. They're unloving. They're sentenced to... Can we all just agree to this? He's not talking about saved saints of God going to heaven. Would you agree? Can we all agree with that? Okay, I get that. Given up to a reprobate mind. So we see that clear in the text. Let me give you a couple more. 2 Timothy chapter 3 1 through 9. I'm going to read from the King James. This know also 
that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, which is a lover of money and stuff, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, which means unloving. They'll be truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, which means no self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady and high-minded, that means conceited, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away from. So in other words, avoid those people. For this sort, for, for of this sort are they that creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with a variety, divers' lusts, a variety of lusts. Ever learning, they're growing, they're, they're trying, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And we mentioned two people, that's not important right now, but now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, denied him, opposed him, so do these, that he's describing, these people that he's labeling with ungodly titles, they also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, listen, reprobate concerning the faith. Worthless concerning the faith. Reprobate, adokimos, translates reprobate, unapproved, rejected, worthless, and cast away. That's the definition that's being used here, okay? They are reprobate of the faith, worthless in the faith, cast away in the faith, rejected and unapproved. These are not good descriptions. Do you agree? Okay. Saved or not saved, people? What's that? Not saved. I agree with you. And finally, this, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, King James. Examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith. Like, check it out. We need to check and see if we're actually Christians. We can wear a cross. We can have the bumper sticker. We can quote verses. We can display all these, 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 these gifts of the Spirit. We cast out demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. I never knew you. Whoa. So he says, examine yourselves, whether you're even in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not, see, that's kind of difficult. Know ye not your own selves. Like, don't you recognize that Jesus Christ is in you, except if you be reprobates? Whoa. See, he's like, examine yourself. See if you're really a Christian or if you're a reprobate. Okay. Test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Christ is either in you, except if you're a reprobate, Christ is not in you. Okay, so all this truth about reprobate, written by Paul, right? Who believes these words that I just read to you from the King James? Who believe that those are God's word? Raise your hand. We need everyone's participation. Do you think that's God's words? Okay. Do you believe that Paul was a Christian? Raise your hand. Okay, we do. All right, awesome. So, that being said, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. He's talking about running the race. Not everyone's going to make it. We're not looking for some gold medal or a wreath from the Olympics. We're looking for an eternal prize. We know what that is, right? Glory. So he says, sort of run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing, not just pretending. Look what he says. I, dis I discipline my body like an athlete. I train it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might, 
I myself might be disqualified. Translations will say, I discipline my body and I make it my slave so I won't slip. King James, but I keep under my body. Like, I don't keep under my body. I keep, I'm, I'm keeping my body, my body under me. I'm disciplined myself. Like, I, there's some things I want to do, man. And I have to make myself, no, I have to impose my will upon myself sometimes because I know I'm about to screw up. And Paul's like, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I, Paul, when Paul says, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Adokimos, reprobate. The great Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, said, I have to be careful. I have to discipline my body or else I will be a reprobate. The Apostle Paul is saying that he could become antichrist. He could become one that could oppose. I got to be careful. I got to train my body and discipline myself because I might be cast away after I've preached. The great church planter, the great healer, the great scripture writer. He says, after I do my thing, I got to be careful or else I might be cast away. I might be worthless. I might be reprobate. From the church preacher to reprobate. I discipline my body so that I, this won't happen. If Paul can become reprobate, if the great apostle Paul can become reprobate, he said it's an option. If he could be antichrist, if he could be opposing, if he could change his tune and get sideways and say and preach and do the wrong things, I've got to be careful. Shouldn't we all be warned? All of us. The lazy gospel needs to stop once and for all. The complacency in people brings death. The lethargy that's bred into the teachings of our faith is widespread and epidemic. He says we need to to train ourselves. We need to discipline ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. We We need to seek Him with our whole heart. Right? 1 Samuel 12, 24, Be sure to fear the Lord. And serve him faithfully with all your heart. Study his word continually. Meditate on it day and night. Abide in me. Pray without ceasing. Stand guard against the enemy. Who would gladly welcome the believer who was transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's marvelous light. He would welcome you back to the kingdom of darkness with open arms. Be careful lest after I preach, I could be cast away. I have to be careful of this. I'm not just warning you. I'm warning me, man. I'm warning me. He said, anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Come on up, brother. Loved ones, we need to stand guard. That's the message of 1 John. Over and over and over and over and over again, in many different ways, he describes believers, beware. We need to stand guard against the enemy of our soul who is trying to bring you back to where you once were. So we need to stand guard and get after our God with our whole being, right? With your whole body, with your mind, with your soul, with your strength, with your heart. For 15 years I've been at one stage or another yelling at people, trying to inspire them to, to get busy, get to work, getting after the Lord in your pursuit of your relationship with him personally and helping other people to do the same, serving him with your whole heart. In our busy world where the preacher comes and asks you to do more, we get pushback. 
But what does the word of God say? He said, certainly you should fear the Lord. And then serve him faithfully with all your heart. So it's not the cry of the pastor. It's the cry of God to his people. He's, 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 he's not calling us to a complacent faith. You can't save yourself. But once he's so gracious as to rip you out of that kingdom and put you into his, you, it's undeniable. Countless, endless word after word, verse after the verse that says, okay, loved ones, now do this. And we make up excuse after excuse after excuse of why we don't do it. The lazy gospel has to stop. And I'm just one little voice <laughs> crying out in the wilderness, you know. But I would just love to see people in our church to just kind of join me in that cry. It wouldn't just be one poor person crying it out. It'd be a church full of people crying it out. Telling the world that Jesus has a very high bar. And don't be ashamed of it. Don't try to, don't try to dumb it down and tell them it's easy to be a Christian, so come to our church. No, it's not easy. Jesus said the gate is narrow and the road is difficult. It's, what I'm telling you here, this is difficult. First John is like the fifth gospel, you know? It's brutal. If you spend any time, like this is a new time for me. I'm going through it again. It has rocked my world yet again to, to, to a greater pursuit of God. And I hope that it's going to do the same for you. Remember when we first got started, I said, as you read this, let God's word speak to your now. Your now. Okay? How are you now with him? Forget the altar call 30 years ago. That's awesome. How are you now? And that's what we need to do. We need to take some time and examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. So this is the time of the service when we like, you know, the pastor says, let's get quiet, let's pray. And you might not want to. Maybe you're just ready to get done because I was long-winded and you were ready to get out of here. But like, don't, don't waste your time, right? You came, you heard. I mean, did anyone feel like God spoke to them tonight? Raise your hand. Okay, so he spoke to you, right? That's cool. So, so do something with that. Don't, don't just waste it, right? If, if, it's, if it's true that the creator of heaven and earth spoke to little old you, like that the creator, the one who spoke and the planets came out of his mouth, actually took the time and loved Casper enough to speak to you, that's valuable, is it not? You want a word? You got one from the Almighty, not even from one of his messengers, from him. So can you just take a few minutes and examine yourself and see if you're in the faith? Here's the great news. If you feel as though you've just totally, totally blown off God's word, completely disobedient, I'm so not. I am just gone completely reprobate. I am as, I, like, because maybe I'm just not doing anything. Maybe I fall into that category like Jesus said. If you're not working for me, like you're not working against me. But if you're not working for me, you're actually working against me. Maybe that's you. Just not doing anything. Just showing up on the weekend. But, but a look at your life as you examine, you, you wouldn't say, well, you know, I'm really diligently serving the Lord. Like maybe that's you. The great news is that if you've fallen victim to that sin, that's all you got to do is Stop and go, okay, enough's enough. God, you spoke to me today so I confess my lethargy to you. I confess my disobedience to you. And as of today, by God's grace and the best of my ability, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
beat my body into submission, right? And I'm going to make it follow you even when I don't want to. Maybe you just need to do a little bit of that work right here. So we're going to tone down the lights as if you were in your war room, in your own place of prayer right now. Okay? Don't look at me. I'm going to stop talking. And I'm going to let you guys spend some time with the Lord.